Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Uh, this is the webinar series from the Ioneer Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. This biweekly webinar series highlights research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Um, today's topic is the why and the how behind treating swallowing disorders. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. So I, every time, have to thank all of those people who've supported us um, and thank those people who may consider supporting some of the work that you're going to hear about today. Um, just some housekeeping rules for today's webinar. This is a Zoom um, platform. You recognize it now. We've all done Zoom a lot. But this, uh, for a webinar, we disabled the chat for our webinar. So please use the Q&A function when you have a question. You can submit a question at any time. Um, and we will get to those questions. I'll read all the questions at the end of the program to our panelists. Refrain, please, from asking personal health questions um, during the, the webinar, but you can certainly submit personal health questions um, to uh, Craig Smith, whose email is in the invitation you received. And uh, we'll also be sending you a survey. That surveys, again, help us bring you the programs that you'd like to have and that you'd like to see in the future as well as to provide us feedback for how, we've, how we're doing with the program we're providing for you today. Um, we will be adding you to our email list if you haven't been on it already um, for future webinars. And just let us know if you want to be taken off of that at any time by just sending us an email. Um, I'm going to ask our chairman of otolaryngology to introduce our speaker in our program. Dr. Jonas Johnson is a distinguished service professor and chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology and the Eugene N. Myers Endowed Chair at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Johnson, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie, uh, for that kind of a, uh, introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to our webinar. I think you'll enjoy it. So it's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce you to uh, Tamara Wasserman, uh, uh, Tammy is a speech language pathologist. So uh, speech language pathology, for instance, um, you can get this degree uh, at the University of Pittsburgh School of uh, Rehabilitative Medicine. And uh, it's a specialty. So she has a master's degree uh, where to earn her degree, she had to learn about voice, speech, uh, language, cognition, and swallowing. So when she finished her training uh, in the graduate school, she then uh, did a fellowship year. And actually, I think has been uh, fully employed uh, by our department and as a member of our faculty for the last over 20 years. Uh, she is an expert on swallowing. So swallowing is so important to everybody. Um, and with that, uh, I want Tammy to take it away and um, uh, have a run through on the why and the how behind treating swallowing disorders. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Johnson, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my topics for today, I'm going to be discussing the causes of dysphagia, the evaluation process, the impact that it has on head and neck cancer patients, specifically those who are treated with radiation, and how we as speech language pathologists can help patients. So why does this matter? It matters because food and drink is very important to people. And it's often the center of many social activities and experiences that we have, especially around the holidays that are coming up. And it's also important to people because even when people get to the, their end of life, some people will choose to con continue to eat and drink despite some of the complications that it brings. The normal swallowing process, when things are working, we really don't stop and think about it. But 
the oral phase is the first part of the swallowing um, process. And it's the manipulation and transfer of the food once we put it in our mouth. So it's very helpful to have teeth. The teeth chew the food. It's helpful to have saliva because the saliva mixes with the food. And our tongue then moves this food back to the back part of our throat. So I'm gonna to refer to this as the food. It's also, we refer to as the bolus. And the next phase of our, our, our swallowing process is called the pharyngeal phase. And during that phase, our palate elevates, it seals off our nasal cavity, so food or liquid does not come out of our nose. The base of tongue area is this bulky area here, and its job is to drive the food back. So it makes contact with this back part of the wall. Excuse me, whoops, I'll go back for a second. It makes contact with the back part of this wall. And as we swallow, our voice box elevates. So if you wanna try, if you wanna put your fingers on your neck, you can feel the movement when you swallow. That's your voice box raising and elevate. It's raising and moving forward. So food or liquid does not get into the airway. This is the airway. And while the voice box is elevating, the vocal folds close to protect the airway. And this epiglottis, which is here, it inverts to also protect the airway. And as the lift occurs, there is a sphincter that opens and relaxes to allow food to pass. And the final stage is this esophageal phase, which then transports the food to the stomach. So when patients develop dysphagia, if the process is not working, they can develop dehydration, malnutrition, and aspiration pneumonia. And these problems, um, whether they be one or all of them, they can lead to hospitalizations. Um, we're very concerned about aspiration pneumonia because aspiration pneumonia is food or liquid getting into the lungs and that could cause breathing problems. And in the worst case scenario, it could lead to death. So dysphagia is, um, can be a problem for people and it also can impair quality of life. So the role of our speech language pathology team and our goals is we first try to help patients avoid aspiration pneumonia. That's the first thing. And then we identify the cause of dysphagia. We then work on a rehabilitation program that improves the efficiency of the swallow by using strategies and exercise programs. And then we help patients achieve their optimal quality of life. So the topics I wanted to review first are a few of the causes of dysphagia and how we begin our evaluation process. So dysphagia is often a consequence of an illness and it's very prevalent with stroke patients. We also see it with neurological disorders such as ALS and Parkinson's disease. Um, we see it with our head and neck cancer patients, those that have um, breathing issues with COPD and esophageal disease. We also see patients in the hospital quite frequently that are de deconditioned because of a prolonged illness. So weakness in general, um, when the muscles are weak, um, it can impair swallowing muscles as well. Trauma to the face and neck, um, there are surgeries that cause swelling right after surgery, such as head and neck, C-spine surgeries. Those patients are often um, having difficulty swallowing. Uh, medications, prolonged endotracheal intubation, which is having a breathing tube um, for a long period of time, usually greater than 48 hours, can cause problems. And osteophytes, which is a bony outgrowth on the, on the back of the spine, and if that's present, it can interfere with some of the structures that um, help swallowing, swallowing be most efficient. Dysphagia is also prevalent with advanced age. So it is normal to have changes with swallowing as our process does slow down with age. But when you combine the loss of muscle mass and malnutrition and other comorbidities, it can lead to frailty and frailty leads to less functional reserve. And what that means is it's more difficult for patients to be able to protect their airway, to cough hard, to clear um, any materials, even secretions that um, they may be struggling with. So we start our evaluation process with a clinical swallow evaluation. And we begin with an oral motor exam. And then we give the patient different trials of consistency. So we may start with water, some pudding or a puree texture or a soft solid. And then we make observations. So we observe, is the patient coughing? Is their throat clearing? Does it look like it's effortful to swallow? And if we're seeing a patient in the hospital, 
then we pay very close attention to their vital signs because when the oxygen levels are decreasing or respiratory rate is increasing, um, that may be an indication that there's something else that's happening with during the time of swallowing. So two or more clinical features are identified as high risk for aspiration. And any of these two um, are red flags to us. Dysphonia is a change in vocal quality. Dysarthria is a change of speech, like a slurred speech. So patients that come in that have a stroke um, and have slurred speech, and then they have coughing after the swallow, those could be two indications that they are a higher risk. Um, and we may need to do further evaluation. So our next step after the clinical swallow evaluation is called the instrumental swallow evaluation. And that is a more formal swallow study. And what we're looking for on that test is the safety and efficiency of swallow. So we want to make sure that the food or liquid is not going into the airway. And we wanna see how well the patient is transferring the food from their mouth to their stomach, esophagus. So the first type of test is called a modified barium swallow or a video fluoroscopy. Um, this test requires a physician's order um, and an appointment is made in the radiology suite. And basically it's an x-ray of the swallow. So this is a speech language pathologist um, administering different consistencies. And then we take a video of that swallow function. The other option for a test, <clears throat> excuse me, is the fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, which is using an endoscope that has a small camera chip at the end, and we place it through a patient's nose. And on the back, you, uh, we have a video that we also take um, a picture of this, of the swallow function. Um, and this exam can be done in a clinic. It can also, it's portable, it can also be done in the hospital. We use it in our survivorship clinic, we use it in our swallowing disorders clinic as well. And sometimes if we start with one test, we may need to do another test um, to complement it to get more information. So again, during this swallow test, basically what we're doing is just looking at the transfer of food. How does it get from the mouth to the esophagus? And we pay very close attention to the movement of the structures. So we're looking to see, does the palate move? Does the base of tongue move? Does the epiglottis invert? How do the vocal folds look? Are they closing? Um, because closing protects the airway. And then we look at the lift of the voice box. So in order to have the most effective swallow, you need to create pressure and you also need to have these valves working appropriately. We're also looking for aspiration. So aspiration means that it is material that falls below the vocal fold. So this is a picture looking down um, a patient's voice box. These are the vocal folds, these two bands. And this patient was given some uh, consistency of food that was colored with blue dye so we can see it. Aspiration is anything that falls below the vocal fold. So this was an example of aspiration. Now, usually when something goes down the wrong pipe, our body's natural response is to cough. But there are situations where people have what we know as silent aspiration. And that means they don't have a cough response. So this can be a little tricky because if they think everything is fine, but they're getting aspiration pneumonias, it's a very important to do an instrumental swallow test so we can detect what is happening. And some of these patients may need to be taught different strategies on how to protect their airway. So again, um, during the either test, um, the other uh, goal that we have is to implement a strategy to reduce or eliminate aspiration or dysphagia. So strategies may be a posture change, like a chin down posture or a head rotation. Sometimes we'll use a breath hold technique um, if there is airway um, reduced airway protection, meaning that maybe the vocal folds are a little bit weak. Um, it's just another way to help protect the airway. Um, an effortful swallow is something we teach patients when they're weak and deconditioned. Um, many patients in the hospital need to use an effortful swallow. Many patients that we see for therapy become effortful swallow becomes part of their therapy program. So this is an example of a modified barium swallow. This is the x-ray. And again, the chin is up here um, and I'll play a quick clip. And this is normal swallowing. So as you can see, the bolus, the food is transferred, the epiglottis inverts, 
There is a lift of the voice box during the swallow and there is no food that's going into the airway. The airway is in the front. So that is normal. This is an example of aspiration. So during this swallow test, um, this patient has material that is going into the airway. This video shows an example of a strategy that we might try during the test to eliminate the aspiration. So this patient is putting the chin down and using a cough swallow to, and as an effective strategy to prevent aspiration. The fees exam, um, again, gives us a different view. The fees exam allows us to look at the anatomy. So it's great to use, I think, after um, patients have radiation treatment, we use it in our, our clinic um, very often because it allows us to see changes with anatomy. We can also see the mobility of the vocal folds, which are here. Um, it allows us to see secretion management, and sometimes we even use it for biofeedback, for training techniques on how to effectively use strategies um, that are more complicated. So this is an example of the fees exam, and this is the normal. So I'll just point out a few things here. This is called the epiglottis, and in the front is the base of tongue area. The airway is down here. So when the voice box actually lifts, the food is not supposed to go in this area, it's supposed to go in the back. And during a phase, we call it the whiteout phase, which is right there. The whiteout phase is, this is when the swallow is actually happening, the epiglottis inverts. And what we're looking for again, is there aspiration? Is there any material, any food or liquid that is found in any of these spaces? And there is none for this one. So this is a normal. This next example shows um, some abnormality. So this is a patient that had pudding that was colored green, so we can see it on the screen. And after the swallow, there was a lot of food that was just kind of staying in different spaces here in the, in the back of the throat. So that is not normal. Um, and there is a little bit of food that it's starting to go towards the airway, but it's not quite there. This is an example of aspiration. Again, this is, uh, you can see there's material that's going below the vocal folds. So the next two topics that I would like to discuss are the impact that this has on head and neck cancer patients and specifically those that are treated with radiation and how we can help. So dysphagia is very common in head and neck cancer. In fact, it's our number one patient complaint in the survivorship clinic. 70% of our patients that come to this clinic have reported dysphagia. And dysphagia can, the severity is associated with different things. So first of all, we always make note of the tumor. The, where is the tumor located and how big is the tumor? Um, we consider patients' age. Do they have other comorbidities? Have they had prior radiation treatment? And what is their current function? And then we also consider <clears throat> the type of treatment, <clears throat> excuse me, that patients have. So patients can either go through surgery or they may have adjuvant treatment with that, meaning that they would have some radiation after their surgery, or others will go a different route and they may go through radiation or a combined chemoradiation approach. And I'm gonna focus on this group that I have circled because this is a, a big group of patients that we see for swallowing therapy. So what we know is that chemoradiation has been associated with better cure rates than radiation alone. But we also know that the side effects of chemoradiation are greater than radiation therapy. So when patients undergo a radiation treatment or chemoradiation, they go through different phases. There's a pretreatment phase, there's a treatment phase, and then a post-treatment phase. And I just want to emphasize that everyone's journey is not exactly the same. What we know as clinicians and our team in the survivorship clinic, when we're seeing patients, um, we know that there's specific um, deficits, or not deficits, but specific things that happen during these different phases. And our goal is, and job is to help educate people, explain what is going on in these different phases so they can go through their treatment phases the best as possible. We know that pretreatment dysphagia is also associated with larger tumors. So T3, T4 
tumors and laryngeal and hypopharyngeal tumors are often associated with having difficulty before they start their treatment. So when patients come into the survivorship clinic, we start with a patient survey. And this is called the E10, which is actually an eating assessment tool. And it has 10 questions. And the higher the score, the worse outcome uh, of their swallowing. Basically what this survey is, is just to find out what the patient's perception is about their swallowing. And then after we get the survey, we complete a swallow test. So we'd use the fees exam in the survivorship clinic. And this is a patient that had um, a pretreatment for base of tongue cancer. So I just wanna point out, this is the, the tumor that's on the base of tongue. And during this test, we're going to give this patient a few trials of liquids to make sure he's not aspirating and not having any difficulty. And there's no aspiration with this consistency. There's just a little bit of coating underneath the uh, epiglottis, but nothing severe with that consistency. And then we're going to move on to something a little bit thicker. So as you can see for this patient, a thicker consistency starts to coat the back of their throat a little bit more and around the area of that tumor. So we call this tumor associated dysphagia. And this is another example of a base of tongue tumor. It's pretty large. Um, patients that come in before their treatment may complain of pain with swallowing. They may also complain that food sticks and they usually point to the area around the, the side of that tumor location. So if we were going to do a, a, another swallow test on this patient, we might try strategies such as a liquid wash. We might try a head rotation to the affected side, the side where the tumor is. And we may recommend a diet modification, meaning um, smoother foods, li more liquefied. So pretreatment education is the next thing we do after the swallow test. And it's our way of connecting with the patient. It's reviewing what happened on the swallow test and starting to explain what they can expect as they go through the treatment process. It's not unusual to modify the diet during treatment and eating and exercise is very much encouraged and we promote that and I'll be explaining why. And then we also explain the expectations of swallowing therapy because it's important that patients understand so they, um, want to participate and do the best that they can through their treatment. There is evidence that shows that um, starting early with swallowing exercise can help patients. It, it helps with better quality of life scores. It has shown better base of tongue retraction and epiglottic inversion. So that is the movement of these structures during swallowing. It has also shown to decrease tube feeding dependency. It's helped with mouth opening, um, better diet level outcomes, later after chemo radiation, and then less hospitalizations as well. So there was a big study that was done called um, Eat and Exercise During Radiotherapy, um, basically use it or lose it. And this was a large study, close to 500 patients. And the outcome of this is patients that were eating and exercising, using swallowing exercises throughout their treatment um, had better outcomes. Um, than the group that was not doing anything. So moving on to the next phase of treatment, um, which is called our treatment phase, um, we will start, patients will start to notice some early side effects. So early side effects include ulcerations. Um, you can see some of the, the redness and the irritation on the tongue. Um, the tongue also becomes very dry because of xerostomia. Um, xerostomia happens fairly early during radiation. And pain is another factor, and mucositis um, are factors that affect our early side effects. Dyskesia is altered taste. So some patients have described to us that um, food tastes very bland, tastes very like tar or dirt, it's um, no flavor at all. So those types of things can cause patients to have um, dysphagia. So these early side effects, um, what we normally see is patients can either go down this pathway where they do okay and they modify their diet, they use strategies and they get through. And then there's another group of patients that sometimes will experience more pain. 
and pain prevents people from eating enough food. They begin to lose more weight and it puts them at risk for other things like dehydration. So it is okay for some patients that a feeding tube um, is planned because if, if they have too much pain and they can't eat, um, a feeding tube sometimes is necessary. Um, the goal with a feeding tube, uh, patients, you know, we help patients get that tube out after their treatment. So it doesn't mean it's a permanent um, plan, but it does help some patients get through their treatment process. Now this may seem basic, but it's so important to promote eating because patients do lose weight as they go through radiation. So just asking questions and promoting and encouraging people to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, even if it's small amounts or snacking in between is very helpful. And we make sure that patients understand that having empty calories like Jello are things that they wanna avoid because if they're struggling and it takes a little bit longer to eat, you want the patient to focus on foods that are most easy to swallow. Avoiding things that are spicy and acidic are important because when the tongue is irritated or the throat is irritated, these types of foods and drinks do not help. So we also work very closely with a dietitian and we focus on substitutes. So when the diet changes because the mouth is sore or the tongue, the tongue is sore, the throat is sore, patients can eat regular foods, that's okay. Because foods, um, these types of foods also have a lot of calories in them. And so we are now focusing on high caloric, caloric intake during this process. And then during the process, we are there for patients to coach them. We review the swallowing strategies, encourage them to continue to eat and exercise, monitor weight, and then again, discuss diet options because these do change throughout the treatment process. So this is an example of a 63-year-old male who had a very large right tongue-based tumor. He was treated with chemo radiation, and in the last month of his treatment, because he couldn't eat very much, um, he required a feeding tube. So when we saw him one month later, he didn't have anything to eat or drink. He stopped drinking as well. And when we use the scope, um, like we do for the fees exam, you can see a lot of this mucus that's just hanging in the back of his throat. So if you work closely with Dr. Johnson, what I've learned over the years is that he always says the solution to pollution is dilution. So here is the patient. We do a swallow test on, on him. So when we see a lot of this mucus, we just start with liquid trials and we try to either loosen the mucus and have the patient cough it out or rinse it down. Okay, so he used the effortful swallow and another drink and that, that helped clear a lot of it. So the last phase of treatment is called the post-treatment phase, and this is where we have we see some late side effects. So radiation changes um, are referred to as radiation-associated dysphagia, also known as RAD. So as you um, recall in the beginning of the, this lecture, um, the structures look very different. Um, the epiglottis now, after radiation, sometimes is thicker, it looks swollen. Um, there is more stiffness in the base of tongue region, which is right here. The space around um, is a little bit more narrow. Um, and this patient, and not all patients develop this, but this is a narrowing, a stenosis that can also lead to some problems. In the research, what we know is there are impairments that lead to poor base of tongue retraction and the re reduced elevation of the larynx during the swallow and pharyngeal contractions are also decreased. So we know this in advance. And again, that is why um, promoting early exercise is very, very important. Another late radiation effect is called lymphedema. And this is swelling caused by tissue damage. So this is um, lymphedema of the neck. 
can see it lo looks a little bit like a, a turkey neck. Um, this was a study that showed three months after treatment, it was found in 75% of patients. So um, our physical therapy team intervenes with these patients uh, right after their treatment. Um, so they get started and they work on massage therapy. Sometimes they order compression bandages. But this does affect swallowing as well because when there's a lot of swelling on the outside, um, patients often have irritation and fullness on the inside as well. Another light radiation effect is called fibrosis. And fibrosis is basically stiffness. And it's a result from um, an injury to microcirculation. There's a decrease in blood supply and this causes tissue injury. So you can see for this patient also, he has a lot of stiffness in his neck. Fibrosis can prevent, um, not only cause problems with swallowing, but even the range of motion of the neck um, becomes impaired. So physical therapy, again, um, it's very important to work with a physical therapist to help in this area. Um, the same patient also developed trismus, which is decreased mouth opening. And this is caused from just not stretching enough. So in our programs, what we, we encourage patients to do when they're going through treatment is to continue with oral stretches, opening their mouth as wide as they can. If it's not open wide, it can lead to difficulty swallowing. It could be difficult for a dentist to do uh, dental work if that's needed and getting a breathing tube in um, may be more difficult. So trismus is defined as anything less than 35 millimeters. Um, and if you don't have um, a tool to measure, you can use a three finger test, which you just kind of fit your three, three fingers um, from the top to the bottom of your teeth. And if they can fit, then you have a good oral opening. So swallowing rehabilitation for head and neck cancer patients, what we, our goals are is to maximize function. Again, we use swallowing strategies and we use exercise programs for range of motion and strengthening. And then the long-term goal is to help patients maintain function. So we encourage swallowing exercises for life. So our goal is to give patients the tools, but eventually um, patients become independent and they do this on their own. And these are just a few re rehabilitation techniques and strategies that we use. Um, this first patient had surgery to his tongue and had difficulty transferring the food, the bolus. Um, so this was a gavage that was used for placement. So it just puts the, the liquid further back. Um, this is a device called a Therabyte and there's other devices um, that are out on the market, such as an aura stretch. But this device um, is used for helping patients maximize their oral opening. So when it becomes very tight, um, this, this can help. Um, the IOB is a tongue strengthening um, device that we use for, for tongue strengthening. So it's a, an air-filled ball that goes on the tongue. Um, the tongue pushes against the palate, and then it gives us a number. So we take a number, a measurement in the beginning of therapy, and then at the end of their, their treatment process, we reevaluate to see if there's change. And again, that's important because a strong tongue is what helps push the food back. And then export, export, expiratory muscle strength training, EMST, is a, a device used that can also help um, improve the cough response, and it can also help with the muscles that are responsible for elevating the larynx. So in summary, um, speech language pathologists evaluate and treat patients with swallowing disorders. And our goal is not only, only to prevent aspiration pneumonia, but to help patients maintain some form of oral diet. Um, treatment involves swallow exercises and strategies. Um, we work closely with a dietitian, a physical therapist to maximize our outcomes. And in different phases of treatment, there are different side effects that patients experience. So um, it's very important to remember that early intervention is key and it's best to get involved as early as possible with the therapy program for head and neck. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tammy. That was, you know, wonderful presentation. And, um, you know, we, we, I think we should have had swallowing on much earlier in our lineup here because um, I'm seeing lots of questions, but also, you know, I work right next, my office uh, is just down the hall from you and uh, the Swallowing Center. And I do see um, how many patients you have coming in. 
and some of the struggles that they may have coming in. But it's wonderful to see all the things you're doing and all the options you have to try to help them manage their swallowing issues. So it was really uh, encouraging to see this. So well, let's get to some of the questions. Uh, we have four um, already. And please go ahead now and, and submit your questions. Again, the Q&A bubble is down at the bottom of your screen. I see more coming in. Um, just click on that and type your question in and then I'll get to them. So we'll ask uh, uh, Tammy Wasserman and Dr. Johnson still on as well. So I'll let them decide who, uh, who wants to answer each of these questions. Um, first one, I recently was asked about a loved one swallowing issues during a dementia Alzheimer's slash, uh, evaluation. Uh, I don't know what <clears throat> um, that, that one of the fact, if that's one of the factors to be considered. Can you expand on that issue? So yes, um, dementia can play a role um, with swallowing. Um, patients that uh, have dementia, sometimes it, you know, it's very difficult to provide therapy for these patients because they don't follow, they may not be able to follow a lot of the strategies. So with that, um, it's important to start with a swallowing evaluation, determine what the best diet would be for a patient. Um, you know, sometimes thin liquids travel very fast and, it, and for some patients, they may benefit from something that's a little bit thicker to slow things down. Um, so diet modification would be one way to approach that if they can't participate in strategies. And then we do have conversations with the family to help support. So it might help to reduce distractions in the room. So the patient, um, you know, their loved one can focus on their meal and and when you're focusing and paying more attention, you may have a less chance of choking on different things. Thank you. Yeah, I, I imagine any of the neurological conditions which could affect, you know, your swallowing mechanism would apply to, you know, what you would need to affect. And, and obviously you work with a lot of head and neck cancer patients that have damage because of their, their treatment. So swallowing issues are prevalent in a variety of disease states. Should a PCP recommend a swallowing exam or test for patients that may be at risk for certain conditions? So, um, you know, anybody can recommend a swallowing test. You don't need a referral to be evaluated. Uh, as Tammy mentioned, if you're gonna have this uh, X-ray test of swallowing, that requires a doctor's order. Um, and then what it really requires is someone to interpret it and then to know how to act on it. Uh, so the reality is that speech language pathologists like Tammy uh, have special ex, uh, expertise uh, in diagnosing swallowing disorders and then in treating the swallowing disorder. So, um, you know, we encourage um, anybody who's struggling with swallowing to ask the question, uh, what's going on? Uh, can you help me? Uh, and uh, sometimes the answer is yes. Um, as we've discussed in all of this, uh, there are many things that happen uh, during an individual's life that compromise function. Uh, so the one we can all relate to is old age. Uh, as you get older, you can't do the stuff you used to do. And so, um, uh, we can't make people young again, but uh, through some strategic exercises, uh, from thinking about strategy and from uh, changing the diet, uh, we can help a lot of people. So uh, one of the things I say to people, which is perhaps silly, but I think appropriate, is that under normal circumstances, when you and I put food in our mouths, what we do is we chew it up. And in chewing, we mix it with saliva. And what you swallow is actually really supposed to be pureed. You're not supposed to swallow pieces of meat that are unchewed. Now, I think once in a while, we all do something silly like that. It can be uncomfortable, uh, but it, that's not the way it's supposed to be. So if you have somebody who has no teeth or somebody who can't remember to chew, then what we do is we feed them food that's already been pureed. And so it's easier for them to swallow. And of course it's safer. 
Thank you. So how long does it typically take to train somebody on how to swallow differently? Is there an average time? So it really varies. It's, it's all patient dependent. Um, when we see patients in the hospital, it depends on how much they can participate. So some patients are really sick. We get them started when they leave the hospital and they go to rehab, they have a little bit more of an intensive program. When we see patients from our swallowing clinic or in survivorship clinic and they're referred for swallowing therapy, we usually start with an eight week program and we get those baseline measurements of their tongue strength. Um, very often we do that. Um, we start them on a program, but therapy doesn't, people don't get better just by coming to therapy once a week. They have to participate. They wanna, they need to be engaged to get their best outcomes. So we develop home programs for people to work on. When they come back at the end, um, you know, throughout that course of the eight weeks, at the end, we check measurements again, and we might repeat the swallow test. So people will have some different intervals where they'll need to be retested to see if we made progress, if there's change. And at that time, that's when we're trying to see if we can hopefully change their diet. And everything's about quality of life. It's, it's getting them to be the best that they can be. Um, and, and that might mean for some patients, even if they have a feeding tube, um, a lot of patients still want to be able to be able to drink or eat something even if it's a small amount by mouth. So the goals really are, they're very varied against all patients because everyone has their different objectives of what they want to do. And we always say, you're the driver, we're here to help support that. Yeah, and, and you know, I expect that most of the people who are watching this session today uh, exercise, okay? So uh, the exercise physiologists say that you can build muscle by doing repetitions. You know, so we're used to repetitions on your bicep or repetitions on your legs. Well, the throat is muscle. And so if you have an expert like Tammy Wasserman helping you build muscle in your throat, then in eight weeks, you can be a better swallower. It actually works. You know, it does work. Uh, uh, and I'll be the first to go back and remind you that I already said I can't make you young again, but we certainly can improve on situations that we uh, that we encounter. So I guess this is kind of following up from that um, statement, Jonas. If swallowing issues are a result of illness, and you know, or I guess from radiation therapy or other conditions, are those are those issues permanent, or or, oh, or are... that's good. I mean, a good question, a great question. Uh, I mean, it varies again on basically what caused it. Yeah. So um, if you were acutely ill and you lost a lot of muscles, uh, you can be go to rehab and you can build those muscles and you could hope to get back to where you started. Now, if you've had something terrible happen, like a stroke, then you may have to deal with some deficits forever. Although even then, people who have strokes do improve and people who have strokes can exercise and with proper instruction uh, can get better. So, uh, you know, we always are optimistic that there is opportunity to help people. And, and we know that swallowing and eating is so important to people's worldwide. Everybody wants to swallow. That's what we do when we're social. And so we do our best to help them. So is cancer the number one cause of swallowing issues, like head and neck cancers? Oh, no. No. Uh, uh, you know, cancer of the throat is kind of an orphan disease. Uh, it affects 4% uh, of Americans. It's 4% of cancer. 4% of cancer. So it's an orphan. It's, it's a small number. I, I think uh, the, um, the government reports about 60,000 people are affected with throat cancer a year. So that's a really a small number. So uh, much more common sources of swallowing disorders are neurologic diseases, you know, uh, and then I think really old age 
because as we get older, uh, we lose muscle. We call that deconditioning. And as you decondition, you have more and more trouble walking uh, and doing other kinds of activities of daily living. And one of them is swallowing. Thank you for that clarification. Um, well, this is a, I guess maybe a, falls in the category of a personal question, but I think I can make it interesting for everybody. Do carbonated beverages give people trouble swallowing or would they ever cause any discomfort um, for people when they swallow? So there have been some studies that show carbonated beverages can actually stimulate a swallow a little bit more, um, meaning that uh, instead of having a swallow delay, people sense that carbonation and, and that they would trigger a swallow a little bit quicker. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Now, I've heard people tell me they don't like carbonation. Um, actually, I may be one of them, but... <laughs> I think for people who are impaired, the tickling or the bubbly thing uh, gives them some uh, enhanced alertness or enhanced awareness. And it sometimes seems to help, yep. Okay. And uh, as, as far as, uh, if there's more to that question, please uh, follow up uh, um, the, the person who asked. Um, that is the end of our questions. And uh, I'll give people a minute here if they wanna ask another one, but thank you both so much. Um, again, I think this is a program that we uh, need to continue to follow up on because there's a large number of people that obviously have this condition and, and uh, we see how much it affects them. Um, you know, I have to say, you know, um, it, you, it's one of those things you more or less take for granted because we, you know, we obviously we eat every day, we swallow every day, but once, once you have a, know somebody that's had difficulty with that, you really do see how much it impacts their quality of life. And thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Thank you for um, trying to find out what the best pathways are to provide better care for people. That is everything that we want to support through the Ioneer Foundation. That's, that's our mission. That's our goal is trying to advance patient care. Um, we have had uh, donors who've supported that over the years and have made that, that uh, helped us move some of the research along that, that uh, you heard about today. Um, thank you for all those who've done so. Um, I think we may have run out of questions. So we'll go ahead and say goodbye until we get together again, um, two weeks. Um, we have another uh, program. I well, actually Craig's not here to correct me. We, we are gonna take a break over um, the holidays, but um, I believe we do. We do have one more program on, on uh, in two weeks, and then it'll be a break for the holidays and coming back after the first of the year. But looking forward to seeing um, those of you uh, who want to come to our program next time. Um, thank you. Have a great rest of your day.